everybody to Symbi Beta Live and what an amazing time to be alive. It's a, a fantastic day here in California and it's a fantastic day around the world because we have antibody warriors on the line today who are making antibodies against COVID-19 and we're going to be taking a deep dive all around what's going on in the industry, what's going on in the world and how antibodies can be a big part of the solution to the COVID-19 response. I would love to know where you're dialing in from today. So if you want to type it into the chat box, uh, all of our panelists can see. So send it out to all attendees and all panelists and uh, show some love and appreciation for what everybody's uh, working on here today. And uh, it's really motivating. And uh, we want to say a big thank you for all of them for dedicating some time today to come and talk to us all about the wonderful world of antibodies and what's going on in the industry. All of this would not be possible without our good friends at Twist Biosciences and Twist Bioscience is making a lot of DNA in the response against COVID-19. And we'll be talking with Aaron Sado, who is with Twist Biopharma about the role that synthetic DNA plays in the COVID-19 response. If you would like to sponsor one of these and have an important conversation within the industry or within the broader public, then please drop me a note, john.cumbers at synbiobeta.com, as we would love to foster these kinds of dialogues, particularly when everybody's at home, everybody's stressed, uh, we hope that we're providing a beacon of hope, a beacon of positivity. So I can see a lot of people dialing in from Ohio, Illinois, Boston, Ensenadas, uh, San Jose, San Diego. A lot of you are here in California, Huntsville, Alabama, London, UK. Wow, a lot of Tel Aviv, Israel, New York, San Francisco, Athens, Georgia, Boulder, Colorado, Sweden. Excellent. Really, really good to see so many of you joining. I see we have uh, already 360 people uh, who are joining us live. This is an awesome way to interact with scientists and to get down deep under the hood of what's going on, particularly around antibody engineering. This is a live Q&A, so I want to let you know that if you have questions for any of the panelists, it's a two-hour show today, and uh, if you have questions for any of the panelists, then type them into the Q&A box below, and we can ask as many of them as we get to. Also, if you want to ask them live, raise your hand, press that button and raise your hand, and I will call on you live to ask the panelists a particular question. Also, if you we would love for this to be interactive amongst you attendees and also the panelists. We have a record number of speakers today and we're gonna to try to slice it up evenly and get to everybody because everybody's got some really interesting things to say and really important things that they're doing. But we also wanted to say that if you see somebody else has asked the question that you know the answer to, help us out, type it into the box because we, we're never able to get to the questions that we, all the questions that we wanna to get to. And also panelists, if you are, keep an eye on the Q&A and, and, and the chat, and if you can answer the question uh, in the chat and save some time uh, for the discussion, then please do that. So uh, you're going to be forgiven if we see you typing away at your computer screen. Uh, what you won't be forgiven is if you're checking email um, uh, and, not, and not paying attention to, uh, to the town hall today. Um, you'll also be forgiven if you're on Twitter and we want you to go on Twitter and we want you to go on Twitter right now and say, I'm watching Symbiobeta live. And so if you can do that and tag Symbiobeta at Symbiobeta, this is gonna help spread the wonderful word of the work that we're doing and the wonderful work that everybody on this panel is doing today. Additionally, we are live on YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, there is some amazing content, including a fireside chat with George Church, a 3D environment where we went deep inside the spike protein inside of the 3D virtual environment called Nanome and a whole bunch more. So check out our YouTube channel and subscribe today. I see we have Esther Dyson, a good friend of ours in New York. And that's a good reminder that next week, Esther's gonna be on a show on Friday, all about coronavirus diagnostics. So that's gonna be a very special show and that's sponsored by Mayfield, the venture fund. Urshit uh, Parikh is also gonna be on that show. And we're gonna be talking about the uh, dare I say it, the, the disastrous uh, uh, diagnostics response that we've seen, um, uh, particularly here in the US. So we're going to be uh, lifting the hood on that and seeing what we can do. But as I said, today is all about antibodies and what they can do and, uh, and why they are important. And I want to jump right over to Jim Crow, who's one of the world's leading experts in COVID-19 antibodies. Jim is at Vanderbilt University, at the Vanderbilt Vaccine Center. Jim, welcome to Symbiobeta Live. And if you want to unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and, and what you're seeing on the ground there. Thanks for uh, having us all. And it's a really important time to think about how to make antibodies as fast as possible and the highest quality <laughs> antibodies to prevent or treat infection. So our group has been uh, thinking about antibodies for 25 years and developing platform technologies. More recently, we've been involved in a DARPA program, the U.S. Department of Defense, 
uh, has a research program called the Pandemic Preparedness Program, so or P3. And the whole idea of that program was how fast can you go? The challenge of the grant was to start with a blood sample and then inject people 60 days later with a prevention or cure. And uh, that was sort of silly because that wasn't possible. The typical antibody time frame from starting to discovery to a clinical trial is three, four years typically. Even making the materials is often a two-year process. But it was a challenge and uh, four sites were funded um, at uh, AstraZeneca, Duke, Absellera, and our site at Vanderbilt with a consortium of collaborators. So we're all uh, trying to develop those pipelines. And we did this last year uh, with Zika as a model. We went from blood through discovery of a thousand antibodies and down selected small animal models and primate studies and finished that all in 78 days. So we'd already sort of prototyped how to do what we're calling a sprint. Uh, and we were planning to do another simulated sprint with another target in January. We were getting all ready to go, and DARPA turned to us and said, no, 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 forget that target. This is for real. Uh, let's go with, um, with coronavirus. So that's when we started the third week of January, and we've been running 20 hours ever since a day. Wow, fantastic. So let me just make sure that I understand. So we've got DARPA, part of the uh, Department of Defense. They're funding a pandemic preparedness program. Uh, dare I dare I call it a PPP? How much was DARPA's PPP? How much money did they put into that? Um, I think there was over a hundred million dollars. Our our grant in particular was twenty eight million dollar grant. Okay. Uh, does, and does anybody online know how much the the latest PPP, the Payment Protection Program, uh, was? Anybody want to throw that out? I think we're talking in the trillions. So uh, maybe we should have front loaded the other PPP a little bit more uh, uh, than the than the current one. But let me let me not get into that. There right. we go, 2.3 trillion dollars. So one PPP, the PEP, pep uh, the, uh, say the DARPA one again, it was the Pandemic it's, Preparedness. It's Pandemic Preparedness Program. Yeah. Program, okay, so we've got two yeah, PPPs. P3, uh, it's called P3. P3. Okay, <laughs> got it. So um, so that was, and that was specifically for, for viral pandemics, is that right? Or is it antibiotics resistance as well? Well, any, any pandemic and each site could pick their targets. Uh, as far as I know, all the sites chose viral targets because those tend to be the, uh, the ones that come up. So all four sites have been trying to do things. Uh, but we launched third week of January and we're basically done with our discovery program. We have several thousand antibodies and we're down selecting in animals and we have three or four partners. And by next week, everyone... Uh, that we're partnering with will have already locked in on their clinical candidates and their starting manufacturers. So um, we did do a very rapid discovery program based on the technologies we developed in that uh, DARPA exploration. Fantastic. And again, uh, for everybody online, we're, we're trying to foster a dialogue amongst you antibody experts, but we also have a lot of people from the general public tuning in. We're live on YouTube, we're live on Twitter. So I just want to translate why antibodies are important for everybody. So of course, we know that we've got these uh, nasty viruses getting into our body. We know that we have an immune system that produces these antibodies that recognize those particular targets. And we know that the reason that COVID-19 has become such a, such a pandemic, uh, the virus, we don't have antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so uh, uh, a lot of the panelists here today have been, have been sequencing patients who had COVID-19 early on sequencing their, their blood serum and finding those antibodies and finding the B cells that produce those antibodies. And then the hope is now that those antibodies can be used uh, either to give back to existing patients or uh, to, to new patients, or they can be used for then turning those antibodies into new therapies that are gonna be able to be scaled up and used as a very, you know, in the short term, in hopefully by the end of the summer as antibody therapies uh, against the COVID-19. Is that right, James? That's right. You can use, well, there's three ways you can use antibodies. You can do it before people are exposed. So that would be prevention, like a frontline worker. The second is someone who has been exposed, but not ill yet. That's called post-exposure prophylaxis. And the third is someone comes in ill, either mild illness, which would be great because you could probably treat them then, or they're on a ventilator, which is late illness. And that's very difficult to treat. So those are the scenarios, prevention, post-exposure prophylaxis, or treatment. Great. Excellent. Well, fantastic. So I'm going to go around all the panelists very shortly, and uh, if, if we, we can just go to the to the to the view of everybody, and I just like the panelists to put their hands up. Uh, how many of you are involved in work in sequencing of patients who've already had 
COVID-19 and searching for antibodies. If you could just raise your hand if you've got mm -hmm. some involvement in that. Okay, excellent. And uh, how many of you are engineering uh, new kinds of antibodies against uh, COVID-19? If you can just raise your hand. Great, I see Jake and Aaron, excellent. And uh, Lantang, thank you. And how many of you uh, have technologies that are enabling either well, let's say uh, technologies that are en enabling antibody discovery. If you can just uh, raise your hand if you're uh, great. A lot of technologists on the line, fantastic. And, uh, and, uh, and I know, uh, David, you're involved in the scale up. Uh, David Mace at, uh, at, uh, at Scale Bio, uh, Bio Labs is involved in the, in the scale up. Um, great, well, fantastic. So I think we've covered, uh, we've covered broadly the, the kinds of topics that we're gonna be talking about today. I want to just jump over and James will come back to, to, to know some of the details and, and, and the progress that you're making. But I want to come back to, uh, to or I want to bring in Sarah Hollebeck, who's at Luminary Labs. Sarah, if you could just uh, give us a sense of what you're seeing uh, on the ground in terms of understanding the, the impact that antibodies are going to have on the, on the very human tragedy that we're seeing unfolding in the pandemic. Why is this topic important? Yes, while we're allowing the time for science to unfold, our work is primarily concentrated around what are the implications of antibodies as treatment or prevention in a smart restart. So we're very interested at looking at, um, are we prepared for what it will take to distribute a treatment or a prevention mechanism? How might cities, states, nations, or even businesses consider the implications of antibodies as prevention or treatment. So let's imagine you know, many lay people will hear about the science that you are all unfolding in your labs. And unfortunately, humans tend to watch too much YouTube and fast forward to what could be true. Um, the big question is, are we prepared for a two-class society where some people have resistance and some people don't? Um, are we um, prepared to develop models, projection models, based on how an economy will be tied to immunity? whether it is attained naturally or through an antibody um, initiative. And so many of these questions, I think, uh, you know, yesterday, Governor Cuomo in New York, where I'm based in New York City, said that they had hired McKinsey to think about how we might restart. And, and he talked very openly about the role of antibodies and, and the questions that are open for policymakers. Great, excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Erin Sado, I want to bring you in. Um, thanks again for Twist Bioscience for sponsoring this town hall. Thanks, it's an incredibly John. important time, incredibly important time <clears throat> for, for synthetic biology, for synthetic DNA, and for antibody discovery. Could you just give us a quick uh, understanding of, of, of why that's important, what Twist does, and, and some of the work that you're doing? Certainly. So Twist as a whole um, definitely um, contributes to this in the sense that we have a fantastic DNA platform that we can uh, synthesize clonal genes. And so certainly, I think a lot of the people on the call today are utilizing Twist to make a lot of the fantastic antibody genes that they're discovering as part of their process. So that's really um, a major part of how we're contributing, as, as well as uh, we've also put out a lot of controls recently um, for doing uh, testing related to SARS-CoV-2. And then finally, um, we have been collaborating with Van, uh, Dr. Crow's lab at Vanderbilt, as well as some of our own libraries to see if we can come up with an antibodies against the virus as well. Excellent, thank you. I want to bring you in, Jake Glanville. You've been the, uh, you are the star of Netflix pandemic series. You have a huge following on, on Twitter now. You're a celebrity scientist. It's an honor to have you on. Um, you're taking a slightly different approach. You didn't start with serum from human patients who've had COVID-19, but instead you went back to the books of history and, and tell us about what, what you've been working on. Sorry, Jake, you're on mute. Wah, wah, wah. And I'm back. All right. <laughs> uh, so I, when I'm looking at these kinds of problems, I try to focus on broad spectrum solutions. So we have a broad spectrum vaccine technology that was the focus of the Netflix documentary. And here for the coronavirus crisis, we were trying to do is create broad spectrum antibodies that would not just solve the current myopic crisis, but give us tools that were not caught with uh, flat footed in the future. So for our engineering programs, we went back to a series of anti SARS antibodies that were vigorously neutralizing SARS. They were produced too late as we typically do in outbreaks, but those things protected animals. They neutralized the virus. Fantastic, except that they hit SARS and not the coronavirus. But we've engineered them to now adapt to the novel coronavirus. And in the process, we've created some broadly neutralizing antibodies. And the goal here is we think those are some of the most important medicines we should produce because 
not only does it solve this current crisis and protect us against escape variants, but it puts us in a position where the next coronavirus to pop up, we actually have a tool at our disposal, so we're not um, stuck. So that, that was right. the work we did. Uh, the other thing I think about, which is I appreciated Sarah's comments, is that we never took venture capital, and that puts us in a position of having more flexibility about charging closer to cost of goods. Uh, and thinking about things like setting up a licensing model where various countries could nationalize production of the antibody and, their, and basically give grants to their own biotechnology, which greatly accelerates the ability of multiple nations to produce the product simultaneously. Uh, we're also working with SwissScale on um, coming up with try to come up with creative methods to reduce cost of goods and increase uh, global access. So those are the things I focus on is sort of how do you solve this problem, but also the next problems? How do you release a drug? closer to cost of goods, because it doesn't do us any damn good if we produce a medicine, but everyone doesn't have access to it. And so I think that's part of the, the problem. And part of our emphasis on antibodies rather than vaccines is that uh, the whole problem here is the 10% of people that go to a hospital and have risk of getting very sick. If we can treat the people at the hospitals, the virus acts as its own vaccine in the majority of people that don't get that sick. And then as soon as the hospitals are not clogged with people that are dying or stuck there a long time, then we can all go back to work. So by my estimation, this was the fastest way to, to fix the crisis. Excellent, thank you. Just wanna go back to the SARS uh, pandemic, I think it was in 2003, and you said that you used antibodies against that. How were those antibodies found? Were they found from sequencing patients who'd recovered? They came from five different sources. Uh, two of them came from patients, so convalescent recovered antibodies that worked well against the virus. Two of them came from populations of antibodies from supposedly healthy controls that we don't think were exposed to SARS, but uh, you can find good antibodies in random healthy people. One of them came from a mouse, and we used a very powerful technology in our laboratory where we were able to create billions of versions of those antibodies and adapt them rapidly. These antibodies already had two years of research on them, so we were able to hitchhike on antibodies that are already known to neutralize these viruses and to protect animals from getting infected. And so if we could adapt those antibodies that are already binding the right neutralizing sites and the right orientations to a, re a relative virus, that was one of the fastest ways to create a broadly neutralizing antibody with a whole body of existing knowledge around it. So and in our process, we can also increase the thermostability of those antibodies and affinity mature them far beyond what nature typically achieves, which means you can deliver a smaller dose. Part of our goal is we, we are still evaluating this, but it would be nice to be able to deliver subcutaneous injections rather than IV infusions, because then that greatly improves the ability to do mass distribution outside of clinical settings. Great, and we'll definitely come back to the topic of, of drug pricing and distribution, and I thank you for bringing it up. I also want to point out that next week's town hall on diagnostics is, is specifically going to look at, at the failure to create marketplaces for diagnostics so that it's actually incentivized to create and flag these pandemics when they come. So uh, please join us for that next Friday and you can sign up to the Symbiobeta newsletter at symbiobeta.com if you are not already signed up. I just want to bring in Lan Tang. Lang, I would like you to give us an understanding of uh, who GenScript is. In particular, the, the, it's very interesting because you're both based in China and in the US. Right. Help us understand what you do. And, and you saw this very early on in China and, and you've been working with partners right. over there uh, right since the start of the outbreak there. So if you could just give us a little bit of perspective, please. Thank you very much, Tom. So hi, this is Lian. So Jinx Group is a, a worldwide leading uh, CDMO to help customers to provide uh, therapeutic solutions uh, to fight the coronavirus. And uh, we provide uh, uh, services by uh, providing antibody discovery development. And we also have a manufacturer related business to provide uh, uh, therapeutic proteins, antibodies, and uh, also uh, GMT plasmid, and uh, sometimes virus to our customers to fight cancer. And right now, our focus is also uh, provide a service to our customers to fight the coronavirus. Great, excellent. And tell us a little bit about uh, what happened in, in uh, what, the, what you've been working on in terms of the response and particularly finding antibodies uh, from patients who've recovered early in China. Right, right. So um, as you mentioned that just now, we act very fast uh, during the whole uh, process. Actually, uh, starting from January 23rd, before the rapid outbreak, uh, Jane Script the ProBio, uh, especially our discovery group, initiated the collaboration with an emergency screening project against the uh, coronavirus together with uh, Chongqing, which is a China uh, province, 
Chongqing Acad Academy of Animal Science and also Chongqing uh, Chem Biotech uh, Company. And uh, we use the uh, beacon uh, machine from Berkeley Light and uh, screening the uh, candidates uh, within 24 hours. And we already find uh, valuable candidates that has a hope to treat the coronavirus. And this is our first case. And we, uh, uh, you know, we are very happy we'll be able to uh, doing that. And uh, recently, we just uh, uh, signed uh, uh, a collaboration with uh, a Shanghai company in China, uh, um, St Stamina Therapeutics. They are using uh, messenger RNA uh, to, as a vaccine. We are signing a contract with them to help them get the GMP grade plasma to support them on this part of their uh, project. So we are helping uh, projects on both the therapeutic and also the vaccine side. And in addition to the China activities, which we started very early in January, we are also establishing a, a variety of collaboration with our customers in the US, including academics, uh, major pharmaceutical companies, and we are also um, starting a collaboration uh, to develop uh, uh, antibodies against the coronavirus with a major hospital in New York City as well. Excellent. And I want to bring in Eric Hobbs shortly to talk about the Beacon platform that you just mentioned and, and how powerful that is. But before we do, I just want to come back to you, Lan Tang, and, and talk a little bit about what your colleagues are seeing on the ground in China. You're here based in the US. Uh, give us a sense of, of how China is now reopening and, and, and what you think we can learn about what China's done, how China's reopening. And also maybe just address the, 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 the ratcheting up of the nationalism between China and, and the US and, and, and give us some hope as to, as to you know, companies that have presence both in China and the US uh, and, and how we're gonna see you know, greater collaboration and, and prosperity for both countries. Thank you very much. Actually, I think uh, uh, I'll be very happy to uh, discuss this kind of uh, uh, topic because we do see how we can help our customers in the US. So as you know, uh, Jinx Group is an international company. We're based in both in China and US, and we have labs in New Jersey. And we also have a facility in Nanjing, China, which is about an hour away from Shanghai. And uh, uh, in the beginning of the crisis, uh, we have a, a major impact in China. But luckily, our facility is not that you know, close to Wuhan. So the majority, a big chunk of our employees can still go back to work. We make sure we follow the government's uh, instruction to provide um, uh, good protection to our uh, uh, employee. And we only allow the certain percentage of the people can get into the lab to make sure the social distance <coughs> rule is kept. So nobody gets contaminated. And we uh, enforce them to wear personal uh, protection, uh, uh, you know, masks and everything is needed. And uh, after a while, uh, I think in, at the uh, end of, uh, um, probably uh, February, things getting much better. And as I mentioned, uh, our facility is not that close to Wuhan. So the, that province, Jiangsu province is actually, uh, you know, it's improved uh, quite rapidly. In that, at that time, about 80 to 90 percentage of our employees can go back to uh, China. But at that time, US start to get hit. So our lab in New Jersey, uh, start to having problem. So we cannot have everyone go back to work. But at the same time, our facility in China is almost, you know, go back to fully operational situation. And at that time, we also noticed that we um, get a request from our US customer. Sometimes they, the lab is partially shut down or they can only um, have essential operation in the lab. And uh, we are very happy we'll be able to help them in this kind of situation, to help them keep the most uh, important projects to move forward. Uh, and I think I do continually continue to see this kind of thing will happen. Well, I, I, I wish we can all go back to work in US because I'm staying home for like very long time already. But at the meantime, if this is already happening, at least we should have our researchers against the disease 
should be continuous to to you know to moving on and that gene script is very proud that we will be able to help this whole process especially on the therapeutic antibody part excellent thank you lan really appreciate that perspective eric hobbs you are based here in the bay area you also have facilities and uh, uh, applications going on in China. Can you explain a little bit about what Berkeley Lights does and then explain, most people have their manufacturing in China. I believe you have all your manufacturing in the US. Tell us what, what's going on in China. Yeah, so in China, we opened, we opened up our office in China in uh, last year in, in November. And it, and it was really important to have kind of, you know, our distributed biology systems on the ground, ready to help out, especially with, uh, as, as Lam mentioned at, at GenScript. And, and so for people who are unfamiliar with Berkeley Lights, we're a leading digital cell biology company uh, focused on enabling and accelerating, you know, the commercialization of biotherapeutics. And so what our platform does is, is we import live biology from either patients or immunized animals. We perform a variety of functional tests. And then within approximately 10 hours of starting our workflow, we, we start to export uh, the best functionally diverse antibody therapeutic candidates uh, for our customers, and since the since the outbreak of COVID nineteen, we've been working with multiple commercial and industrial partners. Uh, several are on the call, uh, and helping them and enabling them to find these uh, these neutralizing or blocking antibody candidates as quickly as possible. Um, as Lan mentioned in February, uh, you know, eight immunized animals were police escorted across China to to the Beacon platform, our Beacon platform, uh, and the team there was able to process the antibodies in twenty four hours. Uh, working with uh, Professor Crow and Professor Carnahan at Vanderbilt University, we found over 500 antibody therapeutic candidates from a, a recovering patient. Uh, we're also, we've, we've, we've modified our platform and are working with Trent Monroe at the University of Queensland uh, to help accelerate the manufacture of vaccine candidates uh, through a cell line development platform. Um, also working with uh, Erica Ullman Sapphire and, uh, and, and additionally, Anyang uh, Lee at Emory, uh, Eric is at La Jolla Institute, to continue to, to create workflows and capabilities that we can distribute globally. And, and so what, what, what would these outbreaks look like if we had these distribu this distributed discovery system placed around the world? Could we combat it sooner? Uh, and, and I do believe we can. Uh, so, and so and I want to come back to that uh, slightly later on when we start to think about how we can prevent this happening again. But before we do, I just want to take a little bit of a deep dive on your technology. Your background today on Zoom isn't just a beautiful looking background. This is actually what your product is. This is digital cell biology, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, so at Berkeley Lights, uh, we, we do this incredible thing where we actually move individual single cells with light. And so when you're finding monoclonal antibodies, you know, one of the things that, one of the very challenging things that you have to do is you have to isolate these cells. And, and these cells, you know, you can talk to Jim or Lan, and, and these cells live ex vivo only for a short time period. And so testing them as rapidly as possible is really important. So what we've done is, is we've, we've shrunken the control volume around these cells to, to a, on the order of a nanoliter. So what you're looking at is the cells in this, in this device, this is actually a cell line development assay, but uh, these cells are secreting the antibodies of interest and you have to find them. And so using our technology, we can help, uh, help our customers find these, these, these cells, which have the instructions to make the antibodies in a very short time period. Fantastic. So I'm just going to talk through people what they can see behind you. This is digital cell biology. Each one of those pens, you can actually see some tiny little numbers on them is called a nano pen. And what you can see those dark blue dots, those are actually individual cells. So those are cells that are going to be producing. Those would be B cells. You might sequence serum from a patient. You might isolate the B cells that are going to produce the antibodies. And you can now see them. Some, some of the pens have, you know, it looks like a couple of hundred cells in them. Some of the pens just have one cell. I've seen this in action. It's quite remarkable. You can actually separate single cells, put them into these pens. You can do fermentation. You can heat them up, cool them down. You can wash in different liquids, take out different liquids. So it, it's, it's quite a revolution in our ability to do engineering biology. Uh, I think many graduate students have been in the lab pipetting small amounts of liquid. This is now, um, this is just on a scale of and, and reproducible uh, technology like no other. And, and each one of these is on a a glass slide that you put in the machine and then there's four about 16,000. Did I get the specs right? Sorry, yes. Eric, uh, uh, maybe my internet connection went down. 
No problem. No problem. Most of it is, is correct. This is, uh, this is actually a cell line development workflow instead of an antibody discovery workflow, where actually these cells have, have been modified, you know, with, with technologies like from twist uh, to secrete the protein of interest. And so the cells, the pens that are, have kind of the brighter signals are the ones that are secreting the majority uh, are higher titers of, of, of the product so that we can accelerate the rate at which we can manufacture these antibodies in the future. Uh, for an for a antibody discovery workflow, it's, it's actually a single B cell in a nano pen. Uh, but it is, uh, it is uh, revolutionizing and changing and dramatically accelerating the rate at which we can find, discover, and deploy these therapeutics uh, now and into the future. Fantastic. Thank you, Eric. And we're going to come back to all, these, uh, all, all of this antibody workflow shortly. Uh, Sean McLean, Absci, tell us what Absci does and what you've been doing in the fight against COVID-19. Yeah, great. Well, uh, it's great to be here. We, so we focus on something a lot less sexy than drug discovery. We focus on biomanufacturing. And so at Absci, we develop uh, biomanufacturing technologies that's able to accelerate these, these COVID-19 uh, antibodies to, to the clinic a lot faster. And then at the end of the day, lower the cost of goods um, for manufacturing the, these antibodies. And, uh, you, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, we're, we're really accelerating the drug discovery. It's really Im impressive. But uh, we talked to a lot of, uh, um, you know, potential partners out there where they're like, look, we have the antibody discovered, but it's, you know, going to take us to go from gene to you know, G, uh, GMP uh, for you know, their phase one uh, clinical trials, it's gonna take them 15 to 18 months. Uh, and we're able to go from uh, gene to GMP in, in six months. So we basically developed the cell line uh, at Absci, and we have partnerships with uh, both uh, KBI uh, as well as AGC uh, Biologics that actually does the GMP manufacturing. So we're able, uh, able to seamlessly tech transfer to them. And so in that, that process, we're able to uh, get these COVID-19 antibodies to the market in, in about uh, you know, 10 months faster, which is you know, in a pandemic, you want to uh, get these antibodies to, to the market as, as quickly as possible. And then on the back end, you're able to reduce the cost of goods. Um, in, in our case, with a full length antibody, uh, you're able to see a reduction in cost of goods by you know, 50 to 75%. Got it, great. And we're now joined by Joe DeRisi at UCSF. Joe is the professor of biochemistry and biophysics, and he's also co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Joe, welcome to SymbioBeta Live. Yes, thanks. Can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. And is that the uh, is that the San is that the Oakland port in the background, or is that San Francisco? Yeah, that is the that is the dry docks outside of four ninety nine Illinois, next to the Chase Center. That's the view from my lab here at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Awesome. And how's the traffic in San Francisco these days? Super fast. You can get anywhere <laughs> really quick. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. We we really appreciate it. Um, before we dive into the work that you're doing, can you just tell us what is the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub? Yeah, sure. The Chan Zuckerberg Biohub is a nonprofit 501c3 medical research organization. It is founded in collaboration with UCSF, Stanford, and Berkeley, and, and forms basically a collaborative hub between those three universities. We employ about 150 FTEs, and we fund about 100 investigators throughout the three universities. Great, fantastic. You recently did a fireside chat on Facebook Live with Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan. What, why, what, what are their goals out of funding uh, basic research and what are their big goals in terms of uh, medicine and the impact that these uh, technologies are going to have on human health? Well, so the, 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 the larger philanthropic organization is called the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. That's actually a distinct entity from the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Uh, and their uh, overall mission in the area of health is cure, prevent, or manage all disease within our children's lifetime. It's a highly aspirational goal. It's kind of a you know, moonshot sort of thing, if you consider maybe our children's lifetime to be 100 years or so. And the Biohub is a 10-year experiment to develop the tools and technologies for understanding fundamentals of disease with an eye towards diagnostics and therapeutics towards that goal. So we're really only a 10-year experiment to see how joining universities together and creating interdisciplinary kind of research endeavor can have an impact. Fantastic. And I do want to get on to the COVID-19 work that you're doing. But before I do that, you're speaking to the 
to, you're preaching to the choir here. These are the bio, these are the bio geeks, Symbio Beta audience. We've got almost 500 people live online. You got to tell us about the the role of measurement and standardization and and really that the, the core of engineering biology because I think measurement is a very big piece of 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 the goals of what you're working on. Is that right? Well, absolutely, and it, that cuts across every aspect of what the of what the BioHub does. We have, um, in addition to a number of internal research programs, we have a set of core platform technologies in which um, we. Have, hire professional engineers and scientists to um, develop what's not just like core facilities, but develop what's coming and what's next and what's new. Everything from computational microscopy, where we're developing a whole new series of new light sheet microscopes that are sort of self-driving, self-adjusting, can take very long movies and give you sort of unprecedented resolution, to um, uh, hyper, so polarized, uh, super resolution microscopy where you can not only uh, surpass the, the sort of normal diffraction limited microscopy, but you can also get information about orientation of molecules out. So Shaolin Mehta is the director of that project and you can look at the orientation of the lipids in the membranes of a mitochondria, not just, you know, see the, the membrane. So it's pretty, it's very interesting. And all that has to do with precision measurements. The same is true in our data science groups in our genome engineering groups and in our engineering groups. And that's the one thing that's a little different. We actually employ a good sizable set of mechanical, uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, optical engineers, and fluidic engineers. Fantastic. Well, thank you uh, so much for that. If you could also help us understand the work that you've been doing against the COVID-19 response, if you could help us understand when it started and what different projects you're involved in. I think you're involved in diagnostics. I know you're involved in antibody sequencing. Help, help us understand the breadth of it. And then specifically, let's narrow in on, on the work you've been doing on antibodies as that's the theme for the, for the show today. Sure. Um, uh, let, me, let me start off with the, the sort of the broader picture, though. Uh, the infectious disease initiative inside the Biohub is something that near and dear to my heart because I'm an infectious disease guy. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years or so. And uh, you know, prior to this, I spent a lot of time bringing genomic technology to bear upon the diagnosis of infectious disease, both in people and in animals and insects and pretty much anything else you can imagine. And so when we started the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, we, in collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, spun up through their Grand Challenges Exploration Project, a program uh, called IDSeq. And basically what we have been doing over the last year is spinning up global pathogen monitoring locations throughout the world. And so we have um, successfully accomplished that in places like Cambodia, um, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Kenya, the Gambia, Uganda, South Africa, Brazil, and many other locations. And this includes both uh, uh, genomic, metagenomic sequencing technology, as well as training. So all those groups come to the BioHub for extensive training. and then. Uh, uh, a, a major, major engineering effort in cloud compute that automates and aggregates the process of pathogen detection, both novel viruses and existing viruses in whatever context that um, locality demands, whether it be the sequencing of mosquitoes, whether it be the sequencing of people or livestock or crops or water or whatever. And so this platform is called IDSeq, it's open source, um, and, uh, and we basically provide all the compute and storage for these global pathogen monitoring sites. What that does allow us to do is aggregate that data across multiple surveillance sites around the world. The idea is to ultimately spin up 20, 30, 50 of these, all feeding data into a central location such that we can have real-time molecular um, pathogen tracing diagnostics around the world. Um, so first 10 sites are successful. Almost all those sites are doing COVID work now. In late January, our site in Cambodia in Phnom Penh was one of the first to detect and sequence the full-length genome of a Chinese tourist with COVID-19. That was on January 28th. That paper's on BioArchive if you wanna check it out. All our stuff's on BioArchive, by the way, before it gets published. And, and so the system performed really well. What we didn't fully realize in January 28th is that fight was coming to our own shores in a big way. And so by, um, by March 11th, we really knew we were in the thick of it. And so uh, 
I converted a huge part of the Biohub's research capacity into a CLIA clinical testing laboratory. We just dropped everything. We knew testing had to be this part of the solution in moving forward in this. There's no way we're getting out of this without broadly accessible testing. And so the, you can't do that in a research lab. Obviously, it's against the law, but you can do that in a CLIA clinical lab. And so we converted basically on a dime in eight days to a CLIA lab. And so eight days later, we had a CLIA clinically validated test for COVID-19. And we have a very large capacity now. Frankly, the one thing I didn't anticipate was the lack of swabs, that swabs turned out to be limiting in the United States. And there's a lot of global supply chain issues with that. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear what solutions other people are using out there for swabs these days. But uh, um, we're, we, you know, swabs are beginning to trickle in, uh, but we've built tremendous capacity. We've returned clinical results to for, you know, well over 2,000 patients now although we could do much, much more, and we'll need to do tens of thousands of more to really get the economy rolling again. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And um, I just want to bring in uh, our special surprise guest that I said uh, we would be having in today to talk a little bit more deeply about what we're doing in terms of antibodies. Um, so I hate to break up the antibody party, but uh, we do have a, a special guest. You've heard about Zoom bombing. Uh, have you heard about Zoom treating? Um, so uh, this is a very big Zoom treat uh, joining us live from, uh, from the Bay Area. We have uh, Steve Wozniak, the founder of Apple Computer, and his wife Janet Wozniak. So welcome, Steve and Janet, to Simbi Bay Live. Uh, glad to be here. I always wanted to be a Zoom bomber, but um, my biologist wife, Janet, forced me to put a shirt on today. <laughs> <laughs> We're all, we're all ready for this. <laughs> um, this, is, this is very interesting educational to someone like myself. I don't come from the biological field like Janet does, but uh, wow, to hear, you know, the real scientists talking about all, this, all the different aspects of their work is incredible. Well, thank you for joining us. And we're here because I attended the, I spoke at the um, SynBio conference last year, made connections that turned out very valuable. And that was one of the few conferences in my life that I said, if I ever have a chance just to attend, I want to come back, but it has to be close to home and voila. You have a lifetime invitation, was. <laughs> Thanks. And also Janet and I had, had a, very, um, a very unusual experience you know, around this time with, with some coronavirus, some kind of horrible thing. And uh, we were in all the, the countries that were labeled the top yeah, sites. Yeah, tell us about it. Days. You know, it's the Singapore, the Thailand, Cambodia, and on a cruise, and Vietnam, and then Hong Kong. And we flew home from Hong Kong. By then, we knew we had something in our throat starting, and the flu starts in the throat. And we had the worst experiences you can imagine with the hardest coughing, and, and it was like stomach convulsing. You know, it was the lungs, obviously, you know, stomach or diaphragm, convulsing, convulsing, even if no coughs came out, something unusual. Janet was in the hospital by Jan, that was Jan 4. She was in the hospital Jan 10, and they did every test they could for eight or 10 hours, everything they knew of, and they found nothing. So what we had was something kind of strange and unknown. So we're very curious as this thing unfolds, what did we ourselves have? It absolutely wasn't detected here. We did manage to, through connections from SynBio, we uh, got some antibody testing, said we had some antibodies to some coronavirus, could be a cold, and we didn't have it to the strains they tested. And I'm just wondering if strains meant there could have been earlier strains that are still unknown. Because we were, we were in those parts of the world and, um, you know, and, and definitely came down with it there. So there were a few connections that we managed to make. One was to Trevor Martin at Mammoth Biosciences and to Charles Chu at UCSF, all around using their latest CRISPR-based diagnostic to diagnose you. You ended up getting, di di uh, getting the test at Stanford in the end. But then we connected you to Jim Crow at Vanderbilt Vaccine Center. And Jim's actually on the line. So uh, maybe, Jim, if you could kind of give us a sense of, uh, of what, what the workflow looked like on your end. Wow, so uh, this is a surprise to me. <laughs> I, I didn't realize I'd be seeing you, Jan. So hello, and nice to meet you uh, face to face. So uh, we obviously had developed antigen tests to find antibodies for coronavirus, the spike protein, nuclear protein, and, and various things. So um, Janet and Waz contacted me through the connections, and. Uh, we actually, under an investigational 
procedure on a research procedure with informed consent, et cetera, obtain samples for research and did serology testing. And um, so the spike protein that we're using is actually from the Wuhan strains that were originally occurring in China, which we presumed would have been potentially one of the exposures. So these guys have antibodies to coronavirus internal proteins, but not to the Wuhan strain. So it, my estimation was that, I mean, what that means is sometime in your life, you've had a very significant coronavirus infection it's highly unlikely to be SARS-CoV-2 unless it was a really weird strain that's very far afield from uh, SARS-CoV-2, but I, I, I doubt that. I think it, you know, more likely you've had a coronavirus infection that is not SARS-CoV-2. But uh, anyway, it was amazing to be working with you. And um, what, what it points out, though, I think in terms of epidemiology is there were individuals, so you guys were in Asia and returned to the United States if you were SARS-CoV-2 infected, you would have been the first cases in the United States that are known. There are probably other individuals uh, in the same case, in the same situation, who traveled from Asia to the United States, who were in fact the first cases that we still don't know about. Um, so the the case one uh, in the U.S. was identified in Seattle from with Helen Chu's program. Uh, they were doing flu surveillance already supported by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, so that's what we know about, but I bet there were other individuals traveling in Asia who came to the U.S. who were, who were in fact the real first cases. We had extreme difficulty getting tested. Extreme, going to the CDC, thinking they'd be interested in our story. They didn't contact us. They were just, here's a boilerplate, wash your hands. Yeah, they told us to wash our hands. I was like, oh my gosh, that's not, the answer, I mean, it's part of the answer, but solving the problem, the bigger problem is, is more of the answer. And we'll be going on a deep dive next week, specifically on Friday, looking at diagnostics and the response and how uh, these antibody tests can be used in diagnostics. Jim, just to, just to finish on this point, uh, can you tell us uh, what you were, were you just looking for a coronavirus when you were when you were sequencing uh, was it serum was it and Janet's serum or were you looking for a broad range of of things? Well, the the problem has been so we when we launched our program, uh, we we launched because there was a single case in the U.S. and it just seemed like the the pandemic or the epidemic at that time was going to spread to the U.S. So we started studying some of the very first identified cases in North America. And for the first, say, four or five weeks, all the samples we got in had very low responses. You could not detect antibodies in the serum. We could not find any memory B cells. Uh, that would be the ones encoding the antibodies we're looking for. We were still seeing acute activation. So the people, even four or five weeks out, uh, were still responding to the initial infection and not converting to the later response, which is what we usually harness. And so, when I heard about Waz and Janice, I realized, wow, if they were infected, they would have been infected in December, and they would have been two, two, three months out, and therefore maybe they would have converted. And so we ultimately found a few individuals who had been infected in Wuhan and traveled to North America. And in fact, those are the best sources, uh, even still, for memory B cells because they're they're farther away from the infection, and it takes a it takes weeks to months to get the optimal memory B cell response in a person. Got it. Excellent. Um, uh, Jake, you have a quick question for Jim. Yeah, I was just wondering, what, what proteins were you testing their serum against? Was it like the receptor binding domain, the spike? What, what was the specificity agent that was used to, to say that they did or didn't react to the novel coronavirus? We used uh, receptor binding domain, N-terminal domain, full-length extracellular spike that has the two proline yep. stabilization prefusion with uh, fusion domain knocked out. And then we had nuclear protein. Uh, and then we had a mixture of all the other internal proteins that were made in bacteria, which we do get hits in other individuals. And uh, so we had, a, we had all the proteins from the right. virus yeah. Yeah, in the screen. Uh, and to nuclear protein, I don't remember individuals because they were sort of de-identified to me, uh, but certainly there was really high signal to nuclear protein. So I potentially could have been a, an un, a different coronavirus, Yeah, uh, actually. Got it. Thank you. 
Joe Risi, um at the Chan Zuckerberg Bai Hub and UCSF. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing? And, and you have something, uh, a study underway that, that looks at much more broad, broadly at infectious uh, diseases. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and, uh, and what you've been doing with Wells and Janet? Well, um, so certainly, so first of all, the couple of the, the things that the Biohub is doing that might be of interest to this subject and this audience is, you know, the, the market is being flooded with point of care dipstick serology assays. And um, there's going to be a bioarchive, not from my lab, but from one of our investigators, Alex Marzen. You should look for that. It should come out maybe today or tomorrow. That is a sort of Consumer Report style head-to-head -head bake off between uh, point of care serological assays uh, that are being marketed to people for like dipstick style um, use. Uh, so that might be, if, I don't Wait, know if that Joe, topic already come up. Um, no, it hasn't. So, and, and this is, uh, we've got the geeks on the, on the Zoom here, but we're also streaming live on YouTube and on Twitter. So can you just define what is a serological assay and, and, and also just define for people what bioarchive is and, and what's available and, and then maybe go into a bit more detail on this study. Yeah, sorry. So the bioarchive is a preprint server. And so uh, in this day and age where submitting an article for peer review can take three months, six months, could take a year to get a, an article published depending on, on the journal and reviewer speed and so on. The bioarchive right. serves as an early way to get the science out Everybody understands that reads the bioarchive that it is pre peer review. And so the articles may change or may get rejected or who knows, but uh, it's a very fast way to communicate ideas and data and science. And in this SARS pandemic, the bioarchive has been critical. There's been a lot of really good stuff that's come out there weeks before it's emerged in published journals. Here at the bioarchive, uh, sorry, at the, uh, at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, we require all of our funded investigators to deposit all their science in bioarchive before they, uh, when they publish their, sorry, when they submit their manuscript for review. It's a way to accelerate science. And I think it's crucial in this time and age. Excellent. We so should just bio spell bioarchive for people, for people looking for it, because it's, uh, could you just spell it out yeah. for me? Yeah, B-I-O-R-X-I-V. There we go, just an easy to remember. Yeah, it's a little, um, a little wonderful. Hard to remember, but there it is. Yeah, so this and is Jim. So, yeah. I can say there there was a very interesting bioarchive paper just to follow up on that idea about using serologies in Wuhan of people who were known to be infected, and I don't remember maybe 150 people. Some of those people do not seroconvert in assays that are used, and the assays I just talked about that we did are not CLIA approved, as Joe was talking about. So there's various types of tests that have been validated or quality controlled or not. Uh, and having said that, so you, you got to think which test was used, but in fact, some people may not be converting or may not convert early. And so we're going to have to figure that out because if, if there's people who were infected and we can't prove they were infected or not with the serology alone, if I think the numbers in the paper, one out of eight people did not see convert. That's going to be a problem for immunity certificates. And it's also a problem for me saying to Janet and Waz, you didn't have it because it's possible later your antibodies will come up. So I think we don't know fully the performance of serologies in populations right now. Absolutely correct. And, you know, I would build on that by saying what's going to be required as we move forward to reopen our economy is to establish both incidence and prevalence. And the serology part speaks to the prevalence and will require recruiting cohorts of known PCR status to begin with that are then longitudinally sampled moving forward over months of time. To yeah. your point that serological con uh, conversion may only happen with a lot of time that has passed and that may change. And so uh, uh, it'll be fascinating to see the distribution with which people actually seroconvert and with which, which specificity to which protein. To the point yeah. about the bake-off, right, the Consumer Report style bake-off, there's probably at least 70 companies or something now that are producing little dipstick pregnancy style tests where you put a little finger prick of blood and you see if you get a, a line for IgG or IgM, one of the two different antibodies, for COVID. And it's not clear what the quality of these are, what their sensitivity and specificity is. And, uh, and, and so, but they're being sold and people are importing them for their own use. Uh, 
uh, I've had friends who have whipped out one of these dipsticks and says, oh, I'm negative. And they have no idea. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, it, that, look for that in the bioarchive because I think that'll be a really interesting paper that compares some of these um, uh, commercial kits. Now that said, a lot of the big, the big guns in serology like Abbott and other companies are getting into the game and there's going to be a plethora of serological assays that are coming out. But you're right, we still don't know what the time scale of seroconversion is and we don't know which proteins provide the best sensitivity and specificity. And we, if we can type into the uh, chat box there, the, uh, the bioarchive and the paper that we're looking for. And I see a bunch of people are interested in jumping in. If you just want to raise your hand in, in the app so I can see that, uh, and then I'll, I'll call on you shortly. And, uh, but uh, was Janet, just want to come back to you for, for some reaction to that. Well, I'm kind of curious, you know, once you, once you have a candidate for an antibody, how do you mass produce it? How do you start duplicating it? That's a great question. Let me jump over to Aaron Sato at Twist Bioscience, because uh, Aaron, if you could talk a little bit about the facility that you've got and, and, and what that does and maybe answer Waz's question. Um, yeah, so uh, again, I head up a, a team called uh, Twist Biopharma inside Twist Bioscience. We're focused on using synthetic DNA libraries to discover antibodies similar to Jake. Um, and, um, you know, we're really focused on helping out with discovery of initial leads and optimizing them to make them better. Um, and once we do that, of course, we'll be partnering with uh, folks to develop them. Um, and so I think there's several people on the panel that are working to provide technology to scale up antibodies, get them into... Um, uh, preclinical and IND enabling studies really quickly to enable us to get into the clinic as fast as we can um, in a very short period of time. Great, excellent. And we'll come back to the scale up topic in a second. I just want to bring in uh, Nikta Hamidi. Nikta is at the uh, Schmidt Futures. Futures. If you could just define what Schmidt Futures is, Nikta, and particularly what you're looking to help out with right now, because that must have been a very interesting back and forth then on the serological test for you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm only a little bit more nervous because I'm getting introduced after Waz, but that's fine. <laughs> um, I'm so glad to be here. From, um, <laughs> so from Schmidt Futures, where, um, as many of you may know, Eric Schmidt, the uh, former CEO of Google, left Google in the last few years and has shifted most of his focus to his philanthropy for social good. And what we're really good at, frankly, is finding technologists who are obsessed with making the world a better place. So you can imagine that in response to the recent outbreak of COVID, um, along with most other funders across the board, we've really um, honed in on how we can help. Um, and also we've developed an investment strategy to quickly respond to new ideas, challenges, and facts on the ground. Um, we believe that synthetic biology and AI-enabled computer modeling will be extremely key in developing antibodies as a treatment, along with everything else from drug development and so forth. Um, and I know many of you, we've sp spoken with many of the panelists on this call, um, have really expedited their work using algorithms that it's mind-blowing how quickly you can get things done now in days that would take human researchers days, months, and years. Um, so I'm just here in a capacity to listen to what the gaps are, what the opportunities are. Um, I, I really want to reiterate that we believe that antibody research will be extremely crucial. Um, there was a science article just yesterday or the day before yesterday, days feel like weeks these days, but um, that shared that to return to normalcy in the post-pandemic period, antibodies and understanding serological testing will be a really key component there. Um, so all that being said, I know that many of you are working on exciting work. I'm here to listen in, but also, um, you know, uh, to learn more and then see where, where others can jump in. And, and we're, we're really proud of our network, too, and connecting the right people um, and seeing what happens next. So thank you. Thank you, Nikta. Appreciate that. If I can come back to Joe DeRisi and then, and then James Crow, if you, well, where are the gaps here? What, 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 where should we be focusing our efforts? Well, one of, the, one of the areas that I think is important that uh, I don't know has been discussed here yet is just because you're serologically positive, that's helpful for epidemiological studies of prevalence, but it doesn't say that you have neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing meaning blocking the virus fully. I'm sure it's already been discussed here. And uh, the degree to which neutralizing antibodies are produced in the population is not well established yet. And so 
I, I worry also about such point of care serological tests claiming that since if you have antibodies, you're somehow protected because that may not be true at all. Great. Uh, James? Yeah, just to, I just want to add a little bit more about the neutralization. I think one of the reasons that it's very difficult for you to identify neutralization antibody is because of the nature of neutralization assay. That assay itself needs a biosafety level two laboratory for you to perform such an assay. And in a lot of cases, that's very difficult. Only a few labs uh, in US has this kind of uh, biosafety level three uh, you know, grade. So one of the solution is to establish a pseudo virus neutralization assay, which is, uh, you know, a lot, I think a lot of companies trying to do this ourselves. And then we also have developed the pseudo neutralization assay services. And uh, hopefully that will be able to help for, for the researchers to uh, identify neutralization antibody, which is actually the crucial uh, part to find the therapeutic solution. Great, yeah. Uh, Jim Actually, and then there's Jake. dozens and dozens of BSL-3 laboratories, and everybody I know at the BSL-3 is spinning up coronavirus in their lab. There's going to be hundreds of BSL-3 laboratories culturing this. Just, just FYI. Jim, Crow, go, go, go Yeah, ahead. so in our discovery program, we've thought through this. So we, we have two collaborator labs, one at WashU in St. Louis and one at UNC Chapel Hill, and they have BSL-3 labs and have live coronavirus. We're doing neutralization with the real virus, uh, but also pseudoviruses can be used. The pseudoviruses actually have a different sensitivity than the real virus, so you get a different number, and it's not totally clear whether the pseudoviruses read out for the real virus correctly. People are comparing those now. It's possible that in future uh, we've used a, a virus, a, an assay that's a mimic of neutralization that's essentially BSL-1. So the, the virus um, attaches to your cells uh, uh, to a receptor, human ACE2, and you can make that as a protein. And the virus uses the receptor binding domain on the spike protein. So those two proteins interact. So you can build an assay that's a surrogate for a subset of neutralization uh, by blocking that protein-protein interaction. So you could envision an assay that was BSL-1, really. You know, it could be a point of care. It's fairly sophisticated because you'd have three components. Uh, but so you either have BSL-3 assays that are the most accurate and the most reflective of the real virus, pseudoviruses, which are BSL-2, and then protein-based uh, memetics of neutralization. And we've used right. all three of those, and we're ranking them. Yes, yes. Um, but not all... Not all neutralization is focused on the receptor binding domain. That's one of the limitations. Yes. Great. Thank yes. you, James. And, and uh, if all the panelists, you have a button to put your hand up. If you can put your hand up, I will call on everybody and, uh, and make sure. But there should be a button that you can do it. You don't need to, to put your hand up physically. So we'll go to, to uh, Jake, and then we'll go to Eric. Great. So thank you. So I actually don't see that button, but I'll just speak. Um, so one of the challenges here is that the neutralization assay is helpful, but it is not sufficient. Uh, one of the things we know from influenza research is that we have neutralization assays. We also have something called the hemagglutination inhibition assay. They've never managed to really establish what is a cutoff within a neutralization assay that is equivalent to saying that a person is protected. So we, we're going to have a diagnostics problem. Really, the value of the diagnostics to know whether you're you have antibodies or you have T cell protection is really, what, what are we gonna use it for? We're gonna say whether those people are gonna get infected again or not. Otherwise, maybe it's not that informative. And unfortunately, in order to know what is the level at which we can say that person that is correlated to protection, that is something that also needs to be established. And that's, there's a missing piece here. And just to give you a sense of the annoyance of solving this problem, they have not solved this in flu yet. And, and flu has been around for a while. Great, Eric. Yeah, I just wanted to add that you know, these, these functional assays on live cells are, are critically important. And so, you know, working to enable scientists not to, not, it's not just, you know, the antibody protein interactions that are happening, you know, this is a subset of the interaction that's happening. And it requires that we, that we guess or know or understand actually which parts are active. But if we can take the actual cells and the actual virus and see that and put them in concert with a B cell secreting an antibody and see that it actually does neutralize, uh, that, that's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and so we've started that work within our systems to enable those live cell assays, functional assays directly on our, our, on our device to help accelerate the timeframe to do this in the future. Uh, we are currently doing things with pseudovirus, but 
uh, you know, if you put a beacon inside of ESL3 Lab, you can do this. Great, excellent. And Eric, I know that you've offered to uh, volunteer to uh, to sequence the uh, the B cells of uh, of, of uh, Was and Janet. So thank you also for doing that. And we'll come back to that a little bit later on. Yes, I want to bring uh, Sean in from Absci, and then we'll come on to Sarah Hollebeck. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to uh, Steve's question about what what's after discovery and and how do we mass produce uh, the, these antibodies. And you know, currently how it's being done is uh, you know, it, antibodies are produced in uh, Cho cells or mammalian cells. It's a very uh, a long development time. We've actually developed a process where we're producing these antibodies in E. coli. Uh, e. coli, you can scale, it, scale them up a lot quicker and the cost of goods are a lot cheaper. Uh, and so that allows you to um, mass produce these at a cost at which you can uh, deliver these in, in a cost-effective way to uh, you know, developing countries as, as well as to the U.S. And again, this you know, really helps uh, uh, you know, decrease the, the, the time that uh, you need to get these antibodies uh, uh, to the market. And, and in our case, we're helping um, our partners get to the market at least uh, 10 months sooner than they would uh, using uh, traditional um, mammalian uh, production systems. Great, excellent. Uh, Sarah, and then we'll come back to, uh, to Joe. I know that Joe, you've got to hop off the call. So Sarah, um, what's your question? Yeah. Two questions for the panel. The first is, is anyone considering New York City as a test bed? Are you in active discussions with the city or perhaps the state as to, you know, the millions and millions of people who've probably been exposed? Um, I know that Mount Sinai, when they opened up their um, plasma, um, it was like a Google form. It was like a, have, do you think you've been exposed? It was initially a, an email that you could write into and then later Google form and I think 20,000 people have applied and it's, it's really uh, unsustainable to do it that way. So are any of you working with that population for whether it's treatment prevention or any test bed? And then my second question, um, uh, Joe, really, when you talked about swabs, what is the next supply chain bottleneck that you can foresee in the advancement of science? So today it's like swabs and toilet paper and whatever you can find on the grocery shelf. But what are we not anticipating right now? Well, that's a that's a great question, Sarah. You know, I uh, I never saw swabs coming. We stockpiled a lot of stuff for our CLIA-based lab, and swabs wasn't on my radar. And I I, I really have been kicking myself for the last month for not uh, you know hoovering up a half a million swabs back in uh, late December. Um, it's very difficult to foresee some of those things and I've learned my lesson there. So I actually don't know what the next, the next linchpin will be. Um, that's a great question. It'll be interesting what the other panelists have to say on that. Great, thank you. Joe, we're very grateful that you could take the time to join us today. Thanks for all of the great work that you're doing and uh, we really appreciate it. And we hope that we could have you on a future Symbio Beta Live to do a deep dive on some of the other work that you're doing. So thanks again yeah. for joining us. Thanks for having me here. Thanks Absolutely. Great. Um, was Janet, we'd love for you to stay on and, and take part in the discussion. If there are continuing questions that people have or questions from the Q&A, then, uh, then if you're able to join them, please feel free to, uh, to stay on the line with us. Can, can I ask one other question and make just please? One you know, absolutely. The best I've felt about coronavirus since you know when we started hearing about it, it when we were on a cruise ship in December, because you know there are so many smart people on this, and I just feel like we're going to get this solved. Um, because Waz always says, you know, brains over brawn, and if you look at who's on this and you know their dedication, I think you know science computers. They're, I feel like you know this is going to get solved, and I, that's a good feeling. But my question is, how can we stop this from ever happening again once we solve this Corona one? But how can we prevent this from happening again? You know, the next. Yeah, that's or be more. A, that's a fantastic idea, uh, Eric Hobbs. Uh, that's a good point to bring you in and talk a little bit about this response network and and what the beacon you described the beacon. Uh, how many of them have you got around the, the world, and and how many will you have around the world if uh, if 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 we really do create a proper pandemic response network of these? That's right. We started to ask ourselves the question of, of exactly the question, Janet, that you're asking, which is which is how do we avoid this in the future? I mean, we have the technology to to rapidly discover antibodies from recovering patients. Uh, there's, there's absolutely zero reason for us to sit idle at this point in time. The time is now for action. And so what we did is we launched our Global Emerging Pathogen 
Antibody Discovery Consortium, uh, in which you know, Beacon users around the world uh, can have access to our workflows and our reagents to run accelerated testing. Um, and, and I think the really fun and interesting part of the discussion is if you have the ability, if you have the virus, if you have a recovering patient and you have human cells that have the appropriate receptor, you don't actually have to know which of the proteins are, are causing the interaction. You can actually find antibodies that are neutralizing. And so we're working to develop these kinds of workflows so that we can find these antibodies as rapidly as possible. Um, I, I do believe that distributed biological processing, I think Drew Endy calls it uh, PB for a personal biocomputer. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're getting really, really close in the sense that, you know, people, you know, you can connect to the internet and a couple gas lines into one of these machines and you can have these cell lines or, or, or potentially antibodies with the, with the encoding the right, uh, or, or B cells encoding the right antibodies uh, coming out of these machines for general use. And so I do think in the future you are going to see some of these, you know, not, maybe not personal, maybe it's more regional uh, uh, bioprocessing units in the future, but if I had my way, every CDC would have this technology uh, available to it. Every nation would have it so that we can find these things at the point of origins, right? These diseases and, and sickness happens locally. Uh, and so why does it have to go all the way back uh, to the United States to find these solutions? We should really be pushing ourselves to, to find a better solution here where these, these problems can be fine and resolved in a local format. Fantastic, thank you. Well, we'll go to Jake and then Casey, and then we're gonna bring in some of the folks who haven't had a chance to speak yet. So Jake, uh, you're on mute again, Jake. I would expect better of you. you, uh, uh, you. Go, go ahead. This is what the problem that I obsess over. So when you have a situation like this where there's a race condition, you can either accelerate your speed or you can pre-compute. And so the, what I focus on here is creating molecules now so that we actually have them ready when the next one strikes. There are sites on, called broadly, broadly neutralizing sites, are conserved locations that do not mutate on viruses. We know these exist on flu, we know these exist on HIV, and we uh, know that we now that we have them on the coronaviruses. If you can make an antibody, like we've made an antibody that uh, neutralizes extremely tightly the novel coronavirus, SARS, and all the way out to MERS. And that means that many of the viruses in between are also not going to be able to mutate that site because they all need to engage some common receptors. If you have that antibody, then you haven't just won this myopic battle. You've won the forever war against the entire class of pathogens. So that is what we really should be focusing on doing is creating broadly neutralizing antibodies, you know, classes of them against filoviruses and flaviviruses and coronaviruses and lentiviruses. Those put us in a position where... Uh, no matter how fast the race is, there's bureaucratic hurdles, there's manufacturing questions, there's a bunch of stuff where if you have the molecule up front, then you're immediately ready to go deploy it. So it's really just a question of efficacy testing, of repurposing. And I think that's how we, we win the battle against uh, pathogens and we begin to contemplate a post-pathogen humanity where these outbreaks are never that bad in the first place because you have a medicine off the shelf you can give to people. By the way, that's what I also got from the Gates Foundation is we have a broad spectrum vaccine technology, which in vivo, teaches immune systems to focus on sites of viruses that never change. And so we're doing that with influenza on pigs and humans, but the same technology could be applied to other settings. And I think we want to do both. We want race technologies to be able to, be able to get to the finish line super fast with the, the other great panelists out there. But whenever we can, we are in a position in the golden age of biotechnology that we should solve decisive decapitation strike molecules that can, that can protect ourselves against wild panels of these viruses because they all have these Achilles heels of sites that they cannot change or their function breaks. And if we can make antibodies against those sites, then we have broad spectrum therapeutics and we don't have to worry about them anymore. Fantastic. Jake, thank you so much. And you just reminded me in two weeks time, we're going to be doing another one of these on vaccine technology. And we'd love for you to join and talk about Centivax and talk about the vaccine work that you're doing. Casey Lipmeyer, can I bring you in and then we'll go to, uh, to Jim Crow. Yeah. Thanks, John. So, I wanted to just uh, leverage a little bit of what Jake just mentioned about how, you know, the answer to all of this is really just about making something faster, making it uh, cheaper also, and also better. But all of those things are really relative and they're defined by what you intend to use your antibody for. And this gets back a little bit to Waz's question about how you actually make these things. Uh, there's lots of different ways to make the antibodies and the right way to do it all comes down to what you want to use the antibody for. If it's for a diagnostic, there are microbial systems uh, like Sean talked about a little bit before that are very good at that and you can get to very high scales very quickly. We acquired a technology from synthetic genomics for exactly that uh, last year. We've been developing it primarily 
for anti-cancer applications. And this is more to address, you know, the cost of some of these antibodies. Uh, you're probably aware that a lot of therapeutic antibodies can be very expensive if you're not insured, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars per treatment. Um, and so, in any case, we've been repurposing our platform now, obviously, for anti-COVID antibodies. And some of the ones that are being used in the COVID fight are to uh, not viral targets. They're to prevent this cytokine storm that you might have heard about uh, and to mitigate some of the symptoms. These are very expensive, very rare antibodies. They're made in fragile CHO cells, generally. Uh, our company normally does industrial biotechnology at very large scales. We're a biomanufacturing company. And so what we're trying to do is uh, use our technology to make some of these really important antibodies that are coming under very strong supply and demand pressures to, uh, again, make them much faster, make them cheaper, and at much, much higher scales than what you can do with a fragile mammalian cell. These microbes are much more robust. I, I might even mention also that, you know, you yourself, you're a host system. If you actually had been infected with coronavirus, you could actually donate your own plasma to help out other patients. The antibodies in your plasma could be antiviral. So there's a large spectrum of different ways to make these antibodies, you know, and it all depends really on, on, on how you want to use the antibody. Great. Now, I should mention, Casey, that you're at the company Conagen, and this is the, uh, the work that you're doing right now. I do want to, before I come to you, Jim Crow, I just want to bring up the poll that we've been uh, asking lately. Um, or actually, if Kevin, you can get the poll ready. We want to ask uh, if you think that you've already had the coronavirus already, um, and uh, we'd just like to know that. And then the second one is if you've already been tested for it. Um, so, uh, but uh, Jim, uh, you had a comment on, on the, how to stop this in the future, I think. Well, yeah, Jake was talking about going really fast or preparing ahead of time. And we also have been using that dual idea. We have a program called Ahead 100, where we, we um, combine the USDA uh, pathogen list, the CEPI list, which is a funder in Europe, uh, the NIH list. You can take everybody's list, and they all predict it could be this or that. We put them all on the list, and we've been chipping away at all those. And we already have antibodies that are perfectly good. I, you know, I would hypothesize they're perfectly good based on their neutralization, single digit nanogram per ml, IC50 antibodies that cross react with Nipah and Hendra or all alpha viruses, um, pan flaviviruses antibodies. We already have these things in hand, but there's not the political or financial will in the world to do this. So, uh, if we go to uh, venture capital, these are not commercial markets. There's no way you're going to make any money on Mayoral virus, Ross River virus, Yang Yang virus. But these have the potential, just like Zika and Dengue, to go all over the world. Uh, they're arboviruses. If you go to the United States government and the Department of Defense, which often funds this type of thing, they say, well, right now, all we care, you know, two years ago, we cared about Ebola. But now we don't care about Ebola. What we care about now is covid and so there's this sort of ADD of moving target to target. We actually don't even finish those targets and then we move on. And evidence of that is uh, we were working on, you know, the, the Ebola money has been repurposed to COVID. So we didn't even finish the funding of, um, sorry. Uh, you know, so we passed the monies forward. We don't even finish the jobs when we commit to it. So uh, then if you turn to the philanthropic world, uh, it comes back to questions you've been asking, like, wow, that's really expensive. Each target is going to be a billion-dollar drug program at current costs. So phase one, you're going to spend $15 million for a phase one trial. Phase two trial, now you're to 50, maybe a couple hundred million dollars. Phase three, where you find out if it works, you're trending toward a billion dollars. So nobody wants to do a billion dollars for 100 different targets. You're talking about $100 billion. But I, I don't know, we already had the number 2.3 $2. $2. trillion has been spent already on COVID. So, you know, there probably is $100 billion in the world that could do this ahead of time. But I think the summary is we don't have the political or financial will amongst us to do it. That's the core problem. We have the technology. We don't have the will to work ahead of time. Was Janet any reaction to that? I, I just I love the way you're thinking because um, solve the problem before it gets here and then it doesn't kill so many people and cause so much havoc you know I mean I think if you propose 
your projects to somebody today, they'd be really interested in funding them because they see the potential of, you know, the devastation and they've been locked up in their house for a month straight. So they're ready to not do that again, you know? Well, I think the opportunity of a lot of people on this call is, um, you know, one of the cover, one of the like Waz's question is like, what's the next step? So you have to make this stuff and it's expensive. So you can do it in E. coli, maybe as said, or in plants, uh, or in there's fungal systems uh, and so on. The traditional way is in mammalian cells, which is slow and expensive. And actually, people have done projections. There's not sufficient metric tons of Cho cell that could be grown on the planet to provide the material that we would need if we had great antibodies. So this might be the moment when we start thinking of, of producing things in a different way and trying them. So that's, you know, it's a manufacturing and a technical um, opportunity, but then you also have regulators who are not used to seeing uh, drugs made in this way. So there's gonna be barriers, you know, is it safe? Should we do this? Should we take the risk that we, we haven't used materials made in this way? And I think, there's other people on the call who are thinking about this, like how to take these new manufacturing uh, processes forward to the regulators. Great, thank you, Jim. So I want to uh, give the answers to the poll. Do you think you've had coronavirus? 11% uh, of our audience think they've had it. And 30% uh, are not sure. And if yes, if you, if, uh, uh, have you been tested? And only three people on the call have been tested. That's 1% of the people on the call have been tested. Uh, we also have a couple of uh, uh, questions that we want to bring up. This is care of uh, Twist Biosciences, who is our sponsor today. So if we can bring up the, the question, these are for the antibody geeks in the audience, and we want to know the answer. So we'll put those up shortly. And I want to uh, bring in Shorty, who is at Ginkgo Bioworks. And uh, then I want to go over to Joe Fernandez, who's an active motif. And I see a couple of hands up, and I will come on to you. We're going to uh, get under the hood and talk about scale up and talk about manufacturing. So I haven't forgotten. Um, but uh, Shorty, if you could just introduce yourself and explain uh, what Ginkgo Bioworks is and what Ginkgo Bioworks is doing right now. Great. Thanks, John. Um, it's really great to be here and to hear about what everyone um, is doing. So Ginkgo is a platform biotechnology company whose mission is to make biology easier to engineer. And writ broadly, that's um, all kinds of biology to address all kinds of problems. And so right now in the, this post COVID world that we find ourselves in, what that really means is helping to accelerate any and all aspects of the response from testing to therapeutics discovery to manufacturing. And we've actually uh, pledged to make $25 million of our uh, foundry capacity available to researchers working in all of these fields. And we're already um, starting to work on various aspects from a high throughput sequencing platform to uh, helping Moderna with their vaccine uh, manufacturing. But specifically for um, in the antibody space, we've talked to a lot of people um, working in different aspects of antibody discovery, whether it's sequencing B cells directly from patients or using uh, repurposing existing antibodies and improving them using structure and other computational based models to completely de novo antibody design. And what's really interesting is that in talking to all of these groups, you know, working so hard to find antibodies from diverse sources, they have very similar challenges and bottlenecks. And one of those is just in high throughput DNA synthesis and expression in mammalian cells and screening. And being able to do all of that on a very large scale is something that Ginkgo was built to do. We have very high throughput in-house DNA synthesis, as well as a very flexible and highly automated high throughput screening platform. So it's been, um, it's really been incredible here to see how rapidly we can redeploy those existing systems from some of the other problems we were working on to working on um, various COVID related aspects. So um, right now we're working on standing up a um, transient high throughput um, expression platform for screening thousands of antibody sequences head to head. 
Um, I like what um, Joe was saying about the kind of commercial, the bake off for sort of the commercial serological tests. Wouldn't it be great if we could do the, a similar thing for antibodies that have been discovered from all these diverse sources and really start to learn about patient immune responses and learn how to improve some of the computational models so that next time we can be very quick in, in having antibodies off the shelf and, and ready to go. Um, so I think one of the other things that, um, another thing that Ginkgo can uh, bring to bear in this problem is I think to some of the therapeutics um, developers in the audience, I think identifying a high affinity potent neutralizing antibody is really just the first step in taking a biologic to the clinic. There's a whole host of biophysical properties that need to be optimized after that. Um, and so being able to do that kind of very rapid high throughput protein engineering and optimization all in house on the same platform is something that we hope um, can be helpful. And so again, we're just here to, to solve the challenges that other people have. So um, we're That's really fantastic. just, uh, it's been wonderful to see how the community has come together um, in sharing reagents and tools. And um, that's been really great to be a part of that process. Thank you, Shodi. in the chat, uh, Ginkgo has opened up its platform in Boston, Massachusetts. It's, I think, $25 million of, of, of usage available platform specifically for COVID projects. We've written about it. So uh, type that in and people can get in contact if they have projects. And respect everybody uh, on the Kriega. And also, uh, it's an honor to have you because I, I view you as one of the founding fathers of the, uh, of the, of the biotech tools boom. You were one of the founders of Invitrogen. You took that cup public uh, that company public in a fantastic IPO, and then uh, of course it went on to to be to be Life Tech, and then Thermo Fisher. Um, so it's an honor to have you join us. If you could just tell us a little bit about uh, the, your new. It's not I realize, but tell us a little bit about it, and then tell us uh, about the work that you've been doing because you also have a laboratory in China, and and you were on this right at the beginning. And you're on mute, Joe. I don't know if you're able to unmute, and we can uh, we'll be able to hear you. Um, yeah, there we go. We can hear you now. Should be able to hear you now. Can you hear me now? We can. Yeah. Welcome. Now you're muted again. I'm sorry. So just click that button. It should take you. I can actually also take you off and mute. I think. Can but, you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear Working. you now. We can. Okay. Go for it. Sorry about welcome. it. Uh... Uh, uh, yeah, let's, maybe I should tell you a little bit of the story how we got into Kobe, which is semi interesting. We're an epigenetics company, and, uh, and as a technology guy, I always wanted to change antibodies from the hybridomas, polychronos into a recombinant world. And uh, so, in the last five, ten years, that's I've been trying to figure out different ways to make recombinant antibodies. And in the last two years, we got pretty good at cloning single cell B cells and trying to generate all our antibodies uh, from cloning single cell B cells. So, and it was around in January, we have an office in Shanghai, and uh, we were working with uh, Gianco Su, who actually sequenced the, the coronavirus uh, in early January, and he gave us one of the first bleeds uh, from Wuhan. And so we obtained the first bleed. We actually run it through our process, which is uh, we do mostly fact sorting uh, to isolate uh, B cells and then to isolate B cells that recognize the S1 protein. And we clone them and then we express them. And we, we managed to obtain, in the first round, we obtained around, I don't know, around 100 clones. Uh, and out of those, we found four that have gone through the neutralization process, everything we spoke, we've been speaking about. Uh, we did the AC, ACE2 RBD in vitro assay, we did the pseudo viral assay, and we just got final data on the viral assay, and they are, in, they are in, in, inhibitors or neutralizing. And like two weeks ago, we started actually uh, working with a pharma company to start making the stable cell lines and producing uh, GMP 
so to go into primates. Uh, and again, uh, we're, like the panel said, we won't know if they're neutralized in antibodies unless we get something in a primate. Uh, but so far, everything looks good. Um, the other set of clones that we, we received, we got, we actually are trying to work with IVD companies and see if they can actually generate an antibody that, that, is, that is sensitive enough that can get to, I don't know, 10 to the six particles per ml or uh, of saliva. So we can maybe uh, uh, have an antibody assay that can be trusted for, for viruses in our case. We're not looking at IgG, IgM. We're providing some reagents to IgG and IgM as a control, but, uh, but we're, trying, we're looking more at the virus. And then finally last week, we released a set of all of our antibodies uh, for the research market. So they can start doing EM studies and neutralization studies and, and, and anything that to understand the, the virus. But there, there are some things that I, I think are really interesting from the conversation that we had that would be helpful. Uh, and, and it's just some very generic uh, summaries. And one of them is that approximately 80% of all our antibodies that we pulled out of 12 samples bind to RBD. Okay, which to us was surprising uh, because RBD is only a few hundred amino acids, right? So and RBD that, is the just describe it's the receptor binding domain. Just it's the receptor it binding it. domain in the tip in the tip of the S one. Uh, so and the S one is 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 one of these is the spike protein, and there are three spike exactly. proteins. Exactly, this one is part together. of the spike protein that makes the crown that makes it the crown the crown virus, right? And it's the spike but, protein that actually punctures the 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 human cell and and allows. The virus to get it, it, is that right? Binds it to H2, and then there's a prolytic event, and that allows it to enter the cell. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, and and, and I, it seems like the mutation is because of the prolytic event. That's how it would finally be able to access HC2. Uh, but uh, but we, I, I'm not a virologist, so I can't <laughs> probably. But the, the thing about it, and what, I mean, I know there's all these synthetic biology. You fooled us. I, you fooled us. I know there's all this synthetic biology going on. And, and, and I'm, I'm very excited to learn more about it and as we move to that. But the, it, I think it's going to be hard to understand how all these sugars are covering the, S, the, the, the spike protein, right, or the S1. And so only nature and be able to pull the antibodies out of nature is going to tell you where those ac accessible sites are to the S1. Uh, that's my... Um, I believe really, that's how we started this project. But there's some things that are also interesting that we have found is that uh, patients of, of the 10 patients that we, we looked at, um, all of them were 50%, had 50 less B cells than normal, uh, normal individuals. So it seems like the virus itself is actually also reducing the immune response in individuals. Um, so, uh, so now hopefully we'll start looking now we have hundreds of clones and we think we have 30 more possible neutralizers and uh, now we're trying to hopefully when all this slows down and we can get some we, we actually didn't get the 200 million dollars for the p3 but we have to do this on our own uh and we don't have that many resources but uh hopefully once all this slows down we can maybe crunch all this uh sequence data to find out exactly what are these things patients look like, how the immune response evolved, and things like that. And our Fantastic. patients have, have gone all the way from 72 hours after infection, all the way to three weeks after infection. And I know somebody asked about uh, maturation of the B cell as you get older, and you know, after later on, uh, we don't have those numbers yet, but those are numbers that we would like to obtain as well. Great, Joe, thank you so much for, for doing this. And if uh, we can type the Active Motif website into the chat box, then uh, people can go on their website and you've got these reagents available for research use, both the spike protein and these antibodies. Is that right? Yeah, and people, I believe, are going to start doing EM studies to understand how these antibodies are binding to the virus itself. And I'm working, I mean, working a little bit with John Rogers, who just started at Scripps, and he's probably going to start doing uh, some uh, neutralization studies in their P3 facility, because almost all the other work so far has been done at Fudan University in their, in their P3 facility. Got and, it. And like and everybody he, he, here... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like everybody here has, has spoken, there's a lot of P3 facilities now that the U.S. has the issue. But for a while, it was really hard to get these experiments done. And, and, and we had our first clone in the first week of, of February. That's when we got our first Terry clones. 
So, um, thank you, Joe. And we'll we'll bring you back in later for some of the discussion. And uh, EM that you're referring to, that's electron microscopy of actually looking at these uh, these uh, antibodies binding to the uh, to the virus. So I just want to take a short break and in particular thank Twist Biosciences, who's our sponsor for today's roundtable, and they're thrilled to be partnering with us on the webinars that we're doing and they're also working on new vaccines and antibody therapeutics uh, dealing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic right now. You just saw the poll that we asked which is that if you already order antibody clonal genes or libraries would you be interested in Twist new service for producing hundreds of thousands of recombinant antibodies? And I can see we've got 18 percent of your work, which is fantastic. Uh, Aaron Sato is with us from Twist and uh, if uh, Aaron if uh, we can type in your email into the chat box if people do want to reach out to twist um who answered yes to that survey uh, please just drop aaron a note and uh, he'd be happy to connect with you after this uh, aaron Excellent. i just want to bring you back in for some reactions to, to the whole uh, kind of gamut of of uh, interactions that we've seen today yeah again i've been super impressed by all the fantastic work that people are doing to discover antibodies to the virus as well as help develop them and again i i think it as we heard like all the smart minds we're bringing to bear on this is really going to help us address uh, this really important need and certainly i think by collaborating we can get to the answers much much faster and uh, certainly uh twist is here to help in terms of the clonal genes and all the libraries that we can help in that process and so i think as as scientists always have been we're a very collaborative group of people and so I, you're seeing that first and foremost with all the work that you're we're talking about now is you know we're, we're all in this together to really come to a solution and get there really really fast Great. And specifically, Twist Platform is, is an innovative silicon-based DNA writing platform. Can you just kind of just give us a couple of bullet points as to what that actually means and, and what is the core product that Twist offers in terms of these, these DNA libraries? And then maybe if you can link it back to the work at Vanderbilt that Jim Crow talked about and, and what specifically has, has Twist been doing in that project. And so the, our key technology is our ability to print algos in large pools, and we can print algos up to three, it's explicit algos up to 300 base pairs in length in large pools of up to a million algos in a pool. So an and, oligo being just two or 300 letters of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Right, so and again, we, and we use those oligo pools to generate all kinds of custom DNA products, clonal genes being uh, first and foremost our primary product, and again, uh, all the work that we've been doing with Vanderbilt to provide them with clonal genes is a, an important example of that. Uh, we also use alga pools to generate um, synthetic DNA libraries. Um, and so the Twist Biopharma vertical has actually been using this as well to um, create our own proprietary antibody phage display libraries, much like Distributed Bio is doing. Um, and so, uh, and again, that, that's been really key for us to um, work with pharma and biotech companies to help them discover as well as optimize antibodies. In terms of how uh, we're using it here for COVID, um, now, we uh, talked early on with uh, Dr. Crow's lab. We'd actually been talking before about seeing if there's ways at which we could design synthetic libraries based off of an immune repertoire. And I, again, I've been, wanting, I've been looking for a great um, project and example to potentially apply this to. And a little over a month ago, we got contacted uh, by Dr. Crow's lab where they actually had some sequences derived from a, a COVID survivor. And so we saw this as an excellent opportunity to um, to do exactly that as well as potentially come up with some therapeutics that might be helpful here. And so in a very short period of time, we were able to make a library um, focused on, based on those sequences. And we've already um, now panned it and screened it against the S1 RBD protein. Actually it pulled out some really um, important hits um, from that work. So it, it can really bear and show that um, even though we're making everything synthetically, uh, that we can make libraries uh, that mimic what's seen in nature to, to pull out things that potentially can be really, really valuable uh, for this particular pandemic. Fantastic. Thank you, Aaron. Much appreciated. And again, yeah. contact Aaron in the chat box if, uh, if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about scale up and manufacturing. So, uh, Sean McLean, if you could kind of just give us your broad view on, on everything that you've heard today and then just remind us where Absci fits into that piece of the puzzle, please. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, I guess going back to, you know, some of the, the comments that were made by uh, Professor Crow and uh, the, the, the need to, uh, you know, mass produce uh, the, these antibodies and looking at alternative hosts. And um, one of the things that we have done at Absi is we focused on, on E. coli 
and using synthetic uh, biology to make E. coli more mammalian-like uh, to produce these complex um, proteins such as uh, full-length antibodies for, for COVID. Uh, and, and we did this because there is no uh, FDA concern around uh, E. coli. Uh, insulin was uh, the, the first uh, biologic approved. It was approved in uh, an E. coli cell line. Uh, and, and so um, we are able to um, uh, expedite uh, these COVID uh, uh, drugs through the clinic by using our E. coli platform. Uh, it's much cheaper and, and faster. Uh, and I think that that is really the way of, of the future here is really just using synthetic biology, not only to help with the discovery in, but also on uh, developing cell lines very rapidly uh, in E. coli to get these uh, drugs to the patients uh, a lot quicker and, and cheaper. And so uh, Abside you know, partners with uh, uh, large um, uh, pharma companies and biotech companies to um, basically take the sequences that they've uh, developed and discovered, put it into our platform, and then, uh, you know, as little as six months, we can get it uh, uh, GMP material made into the clinic, uh, which is about 10 months faster than uh, you, you can currently uh, uh, do it. And so uh, I, I think uh, all of these pieces are really important, both the rapid discovery, but also being able to rapidly uh, manufacture this is, is also really key. Because if you, you know, it, it's all where your bottleneck is, is at. So we ought to be looking at it uh, from, a, from a holistic um, standpoint, both on the discovery as well as the, the biomanufacturing. Fantastic. Thank you, Sean. And you're a startup, we should note, up in, uh, up in Oregon. And uh, David Mace, uh, you're with a startup, Swiss Scale Bio. You're down here in the Bay Area. Uh, can you compare and contrast what you're doing with what Sean's doing? Yeah. yeah. Um, so just a little bit more about our company. Um, uh, I started Swift Scale Bio um, with uh, my co-founders, Mike Jewett at Northwestern and Matt Deleuze at Cornell. Um, and the core reason that we started the company was because we were frustrated in doing drug development before um, and seeing that we could get something up to having mouse results, but not actually be able to pay for and wait for the time for it to go through clinical manufacturing. Um, and so we wanted to solve that problem and focus on a model that enabled academic groups and smaller biotechs especially um, to be able to get their drugs into clinical trials. Um, and uh, specifically what that means is we focused on using some of the work that came out of uh, Mike Jewett's lab um, for doing one month from DNA sequence all the way to clinical batch. And like, of course, there's stability studies and other things that go on in between that that extend that time period. Um, but uh, that, is, uh, that is our core service, what we work on, yeah. And specifically, I wanna mention in uh, coronavirus, um, we are uh, fully focused right now on committing all of our batches to coronavirus drugs. Um, we also will, we haven't announced this publicly yet, um, but by the early summertime, um, have the, we're working on the capability to have 100,000 doses per month um, coming out of uh, our systems. Um, so Fantastic. we're excited to work with, uh, work with partners on all that stuff, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, David. KC Litmeyer Conagen. You uh, broke up. You broke up a little bit there, John. So I actually uh, Casey's uh, behind me right now. Or has my internet crashed? Yeah, I think your internet slowed down, or maybe mine did. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Is everyone all right? Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> right. So, uh, in addition to being a uh, strain and process development company, Conagen is also a a large scale biomanufacturing company. Uh, we, as I mentioned before, you know, we acquired a uh, a proprietary system from Synthetic Genomics for making. Uh, antibodies from a microbial host. It's not E. coli, it's actually a different kind of microbe. It's a eukaryote, it's actually a protist, but it's, uh, it's major advantage, in addition to having all the advantages of being faster and cheaper and therefore more scalable, it's, uh, it's also uh, able to have customized glycans. And I know you don't know what that means, but it's essentially the way that your immune system interacts with the antibody. Uh, you can have an antibody that doesn't have a glycan and 
um, it has a fairly uh, limited uh, efficacy and a limited application. When you can customize these glycans, you can really tailor how your immune system responds to it. These glycans are also probably involved in the way that we actually mount protective immunity against COVID. Uh, there's not a lot of information about that yet, but uh, this is an important aspect to consider because certain, certain glycans, again, will affect different kinds of functions. And some of those relate to protective immunity, but some of them also relate to some of the evil bugbears of vaccinology. There's antibody dependent enhancement of a of, of virus response, where if you're vaccinated and you raise antibodies against a particular virus, it can actually uh, cause worse disease when you're actually infected with that virus instead of being protective. Uh, it's not really known if that's the case with COVID right now. There's other mechanisms called T cell hypersensitivity, which might be more likely with COVID. Uh, this is, again, something that leads to some of the worst symptoms uh, that lead to death. Uh, again, a lot of these are antibody-mediated effects and can that. be mitigated by the glycans. I'm sorry, I, I think I, uh, uh, it, I, I heard someone speak up, so if there was a question about that, I'd be happy to answer it. Great, excellent. Uh, apologies. My internet's uh, playing up, so I'm going to try to fix that shortly. But whilst I do that, I bring in a good friend of mine who is Carl Handelsman, who's at Roche Venture Fund and Code on Capital. And actually, it was Carl who first saw, was on CNN speaking with Raj Gupta talking about the coronavirus. And uh, so it was Carl who then contacted me and, and uh, knew that Roz and I knew each other and said, you've got to get him uh, tested. We've got to figure this out. So uh, I wanted to thank you, Carl, for doing that. And uh, I wanted to see if you had a, a question or a comment. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, my question is, there are over 100 really strong programs to develop antibodies against COVID-19, including the one that Jake, Jake's company very heroically put his whole company working on this and ha already has um, some, some good antibodies selected. So the question is, how do we compare all these so that brains can triumph over brawn and that we can have actually the best antibodies go into scale up, go into testing and go into manufacturing? Is anyone testing these guys head to head? Yeah, Jake, go for it. So I, I, I would love that. Um, I think we, what we learned from the Ebola crisis was, A, we learned antibodies definitely help, but B, we learned not all antibodies were created equal. We had ZMAP, the NIH antibodies, and the Regeneron antibodies. And when, when the bake-off happened, they actually stopped the study early because some were somewhat, the Regeneron antibodies ended up being so much better than the other ones that that was clearly the, the best use for patients. There's a couple experiments we can do right now with the existing antibodies. Uh, one is neutralization, um, which is helpful. And again, I think there needs to be a head-to-head -head of real live coronavirus. So we're working with US Amarid that can actually test against live virus. I think the pseudovirion particles are good, but we need to, we need to convince ourselves that those are actually bioequivalent. And then the, the more important assay is that we can do a hamster protection study. And we really should do a bake-off of these drugs. And that's the best test short of going into a person uh, is checking that these molecules are able to protect the live organism from infection. And the hamster model and the aged ferret models are the best way to do this. And I, I, I do think that we have, you know, the government has facilities to do this, so we should all send our molecules to an independent site and they should test them. And, and really, even though there is a winner, you should still promote multiple molecules pull forward towards clinic because you, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket here. And you want, your, you want multiple drugs to move forward in case something funky happens. And then you also want your doctors to have multiple drugs on hand so they can make choices. And finally, for national, international production, you want multiple companies that are making slightly different choices on how they manufacture, because that's just going to create layers of protection against individual point failures. But, but that said, I think in the rush, not all these drugs are being tested equivalently, and there are definitely going to be opportunities for one drug to work way better, either have much higher affinity or it's hitting certain epitopes in a certain orientation that turns out to neutralize better or some engineering choices on the FC or the humanness of the molecule or stickiness and so forth. So I, I, I would encourage us to run those tests now. Fantastic. Uh, we'll go to Shorty and then Casey, if your hand's still up, we'll go to Casey. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, thanks, Carl, for this question. I think this is a really important point. Um, and I think that there's a number of properties that we'd want to compare them on. It's not just are they good binders or are, are they good neutralizers? But which one of these um, 
sequences is going to be the easiest to manufacture, which one has the best PK properties, which one has the best um, physical properties to, to make it a good therapeutic candidate. So I really love this idea and hope that the community can come together to share sequences in a way to enable these kinds of head-to-head bake-offs. Um, you know, as a scientist, it's always frustrating. You read, oh, in one paper, they measured X in this method. In another paper, they measured it in a completely different way. Like, how do you put those together? So being able to compare them all on the same platform is definitely a goal of ours at Ginkgo. And so anyone that has uh, sequences that they want to share, we'd love to throw them into the mix and, uh, and see how they work. Excellent. Thank you. Um, any other comments from any other panelists? I guess I just wanted to mention that uh, we're open for anyone's targets. Uh, you know, we're, we're collecting a lot of our own as well for our own efforts, but if for any application, whether it's for diagnostics or therapeutics, uh, we're interested in hearing about it and helping you scale it up if you need it. Great, excellent. We have uh, one question that's risen to the top. One antibody which is gaining a lot of attention very recently is anti-GMCSF for treating cytokine storm in COVID-19. What is the recent status on its risk benefit trade-off and how effective is it to target GMCSF compared to targeting IL-6R? Well, there we go for a mouthful of, uh, of word salad. So who wants to take that on and who can uh, tell me what GMCSF is and who can help to uh, explain what a cytokine storm is and then the other uh, target, the IL-6R? Yeah, go ahead, Casey, you've got your hand up. Yeah. <clears throat> so. When you're fighting an infection, uh, there are a couple of different molecules in your body that signal your immune system that the infection is happening and will instruct the immune system to fight it off. Uh, these are generally called chemokines and cytokines. Uh, cytokines are very important, particularly for a vital, uh, viral infection, and uh, your immune system will build them up higher and higher and higher and instruct your immune cells to then go and attack the infected cells and clear the virus that actually causes damage to your body. And so the uh, degree and the intensity of that cytokine response corresponds to how much damage your own immune system is doing to your own body. If the body is not able, or if the immune system is not able to properly recognize the virus or if there's some evasion mechanism, uh, that cytokine storm can ramp up higher and higher and higher and cause a lot more damage. This is what leads then to this ground glass uh, imaging in scans of lungs of uh, very ill COVID patients. So two of the cytokines that are uh, kind of at the center of the cytokine storm are GMCSF and IL-6. Uh, IL-6 stands for interleukin-6. It's a very central messenger and GMCF is granulocyte colony stimulating factor. It's a, um, uh, again, it's a central part of it. Now, to directly answer the question, I, I don't think it's well known right now which one is the better one to target. Uh, you know, both of them have antibodies against them, which you can uh, give to a patient to tamp down the cytokine storm and, and mitigate some of the immune system caused damage to your own body. Um, the, the ones that I'm, I'm probably rooting for the most, if I can put it that way, this is just my own personal opinion, is are the anti-IL-6 antibodies. Tocilizumab among them being one of the most important ones. But again, I think the jury's out on, on exactly which one is the best one. I mean, both of them are, I think, are going to be very useful. And, and, and uh, again, for the sickest patients, have been very helpful. Fantastic. Well, we are coming to the end of today's Symbi Beta Live, the antibody palooza, as I jokingly referred it to. So again, I want to thank Twist Bioscience and Aaron Sato specifically for, um, for sponsoring this. And if you would like to sponsor a future Symbi Beta Live, then please reach out to info at symbibeta.com or you can contact me directly, john.com is at symbibeta.com. We're really trying to foster these amazing dialogues. And so thank you for everybody who's stayed on for the whole two hours today. And thank you all of the panelists for doing that. Um, next week, we have a state of the industry address with Professor Pam Silver from Harvard. She's going to be talking about what she's been doing at her lab and some of the interesting work that some of her colleagues have been doing as well. Uh, also next week, we're doing a session also on Wednesday called We're Not Going Back to Normal. And like the rest of the world, everything's changing right now. We're seeing that as a great opportunity for changes that are happening in the future. And Esther Dyson is going to be joining us along with the uh, three-star general Steve Quast, as well as Karen Watson, who was the strategic communications consultant for the Obama White House and uh, former advisor to Michelle Obama. So some very exciting 
uh, uh, conversations next week. As I said, next Friday, we're talking about diagnostics marketplaces in a post COVID world. And that's sponsored by Mayfield. And we have our good friend, Urshit Parikh, the partner at Mayfield. We've also got Esther Dyson again, coming back to join us to talk about the perspective on testing and what she's been doing with her healthcare startup founder of Wellville, Way to Wellville, which is a fantastic program to look at if you haven't looked at it. Trevor Martin, um, we talked about Trevor earlier because of his CRISPR diagnostic COVID test and he's gonna be joining us. He's the CEO of Mammoth Biosciences. And also uh, Jack Reagan, who is the CEO and the founder of Lexagene in Massachusetts. So a really interesting conversation that we're gonna be having on diagnostics marketplaces. And as I said, the week after that, we're going to be having a whole show dedicated to vaccines. And that's going to be uh, everybody's looking towards the 18 month to 24 month horizon for vaccines. So I just want to uh, thank all of our panelists, uh, Shawnee from uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, Sarah Hollebeck from Luminary Labs, Jake Glanville from Distributed Bio, Aaron Sado from Twist Biosciences, Casey Lipmeyer from Conagen, Joe Fernandez from Active Motif, uh, Sean McLean from Absci, Eric Hobbs from Berkeley Lights and a fantastic piece of hardware, David Mace from Swift Scale Bio, uh, Jim Crow from Vanderbilt University, Nikta Hamidi from uh, Schmidt Futures, and um, of course we had Joe DeRisi dialing in from the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub as well. And I'm sure I've forgotten people because we had so many people, so apologies if we did. And I'd just like to turn back to, uh, to Steve Wozniak, the founder of Apple, and Janet Wozniak, Steve's wife, uh, just to you know, get your perspectives on, on what you've seen today. And, uh, and if you've got any, any, any message to all of the scientists and engineers who are out there working on COVID-19 response. Well, we both thank you very much. And we both have been very um, educated today. And it's very interesting as well. Um, I just think this is way more interesting than most stuff I see on TV because, you know, working together, I love it because there's so many different companies working together and there's so many brilliant minds on this project. I mean, I just feel like this is something that really needs to continue happening. And I feel like somebody on this call today is going to solve this problem. I'm glad to hear that there are so many tools that help be efficient. Absolutely. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you, Was. Thank you, Janet, for joining us. Uh, as, as usual, we will leave this uh, chat open for another 10 or 15 minutes. So if you've got messages that you want to send to Was and Janet, then we will gladly collate them all up and pass them on. If you've got messages that you want to send to any of the panelists today, then type them into the chat box and the panelists can stay on for a few more minutes as well. I'm sorry we didn't get to 23 of your questions. And uh, clearly we had a lot of panelists today and this is a new format. Uh, we'd love your feedback on the format. Which bits do you like? Which bits don't you like? How can we make this better and provide more value to you, the fantastic entrepreneurs, investors, thought leaders, technologists, academics as part of this symbi beta network and part of this synthetic biology community. We love you all. We love the hard work that you're doing. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. It's been one of the best shows we've ever done. Thanks again. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye now.